In this video, we're going to talk about the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So remember, the main idea is that our actions of differentiation and integration are, in some way, inverses of each other. One undoes the other. And we saw that in part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I take a function f, perform an integration, then take the derivative, the value of the derivative is just that original function evaluated at that point. So in this sense, I can say that differentiation undoes the integration. So let's think about this a little bit more. Since g prime of x equals f of x, g is an antiderivative of f. Now remember that the most general antiderivative, which we'll use capital F, is just going to be any antiderivative plus some constant c. So it would be g of x plus c. So let's think about that. And on my interval a, b, if I looked at the value of the antiderivative when x equals b and subtract off the value of the antiderivative when x equals a, well, let's go ahead and substitute that in there. We said that capital F is just g of x plus c. So capital F of b is just g of b plus c. And capital F of a is just g of a plus c. And when I subtract those, I'll have c minus c, which is just zero. So I'll just be left with g evaluated at b minus g evaluated at a. But what does that mean? We'll go back to the definition of the function g. g evaluated at b would be the definite integral from a to b f of t dt. g evaluated at a would be the definite integral from a to a of f of t dt. But the definite integral when the lower bound and the upper bound are the same is always going to be zero. So the second term is zero. So I'm just left with the definite integral from a to b equal of f of t dt. But what did we start off with? That was the antiderivative evaluated at the upper bound minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound. So think about this. If I know an antiderivative of my integrand, then this is a very simple way of evaluating the definite integral without having to use a geometric interpretation or having to use the definition. I just need to know an antiderivative and evaluate that at the upper bound, subtract the value of the antiderivative at the lower bound. And that is what part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us. I have a continuous function on the closed interval a, b, then the uh, value of the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is just capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is any antiderivative of f of x. Now, as we've seen in previous properties of the definite integral, um, we can have a finite number of either uh, jump discontinuities or removable discontinuities in that interval. And uh, we can still make this work. We'll just have to find maybe more than one antiderivative and break up the integral into multiple parts. Uh, but we can't have infinite discontinuities. That's really something that it gets explored in calculus too. But this is a much simpler method for evaluating a definite integral.
if you can find that antiderivative. So we're going to learn some techniques. And then in calculus two, you're going to spend almost half the course trying to find techniques for finding antiderivatives. So let's look at some examples. We're going to evaluate the definite integral from 1 to 3 of x squared minus 2x dx. So what we need to do is find an antiderivative of the integrand, an antiderivative of x squared minus 2x. So we'll do that one term at a time. They're both powers, or polyn this is a polynomial. So all I need to do is add 1 to the exponent, that gives me x cubed, and divide by the new exponent. The antiderivative of x would be x squared divided by 2. So I'm already multiplying by 2. So 2 over 2 would just give me 1. And then I write this bar. Remember, the, that is the same evaluation bar. But now I put my bounds, just like I did with the integral sign. I put my integral sign. I put my upper bound as a superscript and my lower bound as a subscript. So the way I say this is this is one third x cubed minus x squared evaluated from one to three. So what I do is put in my upper bound in place of my variable. That would be my antiderivative evaluated at the upper bound. And then I have to subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound. And then I just have to do the arithmetic to work it out. And so I wind up with 2 thirds for this value. But as you can see, this is much, much simpler. We could use the definition to uh, evaluate this. We would get, the, of course, the same answer but it would take much more work. This next example would be uh, very challenging to work out using the definition. And it's not clear to me that it is possible to do it using the definition, uh, but we don't have to because we can use the fundamental theorem. We know we can find an antiderivative for sine of theta. The antiderivative of sine of theta is negative cosine theta. You can always check your antiderivative by taking the derivative. Uh, derivative of cosine theta would be negative sine theta, but I have a minus, and that gives me plus. So quick check there. I do have an antiderivative of sine theta. That'll be evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. So I'll evaluate it at the upper bound, pi over 2, and then subtract off the value at the lower bound. So cosine of 0, negative cosine of 0. Now cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So I'll have 0 minus a negative 1 which gives me one. Now, this is an amazing result to me because let's think about what it means geometrically. This is the area under the sine curve from zero to pi over two. In other words, it's half of the area under the arch. So from symmetry, I know it's half of the area. So the whole area would be twice this value which tells me that the area under one arch of the sine curve is exactly two square units. To me, this is an amazing result that here you have a function. It's a transcendental function. It's not a simple function like a polynomial. It's defined on a circle. Uh, we're going from zero to pi. And so 
it would be natural to think that maybe the value of the area would include pi, but no, the value of the area is a whole number. The value of the area under one arch is two square units. That is amazing. Well, let's look at another example here. I have um, the definite integral from 1 to 2 of 2x to the power of 5 minus x to the power of 6 all over x cubed dx. So we're going to do a step of algebra. And so I'm going to divide x cubed into each term. And so now my integrand is 2x squared minus x cubed. My bounds of integration go from 1 to 2. They did not change. So now let's find an antiderivative and perform the evaluation. We'll first substitute the upper bound into the antiderivative and subtract the value of the antiderivative at the lower bound. So we need to do some uh, arithmetic here to evaluate this. 2 cubed is 8, so times 2 gives me 16 over 3. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. 16 divided by 4 is 4. And then uh, having evaluations at 1 or 0 is always really simple. So here I just get the coefficients 2 thirds minus 1 fourth. So I need to do some uh, fraction arithmetic here. But in the end, I get 11 over 12. All right, in our second example, we're going to come back to this polynomial that we have seen twice before. We're going to take the integral of negative 2 thirds x cubed plus 5 halves x squared plus 1 evaluate, well, and the bounds of integration are from 1 to 3. The first time we saw this is when we were talking about the area problem. And we used uh, some uh, approximations to find an estimated value. So for one of our estimates was using the right endpoint, we used four rectangles, and our estimate was 10.89. And then we did an example where we found the exact value using the definition. So it took several pages of work to go through and first expand each one of these terms and simplify them and then take the limit. And in the end, we came up with 31 over 3. So we had an approximation of 10.89 we found the exact value was about 10.33, or exactly 10 and one third. So let's see if we can do this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the fundamental theorem of calculus will say we're going to first find the antiderivative. So um, working with these fractional coefficients as a little complicated, so I'm going to do it in two steps. So I have negative two thirds, and then I took the antiderivative of x cubed, that'd be x to the fourth, and then I have to divide by four, so one fourth x to the fourth, and then with x squared, it'll be one third x cubed, and I have to multiply in those coefficients. Oh yeah, and the antiderivative of one is just x. So multiplying out the coefficients, then I get negative 1 sixth x to the power of 4 plus 5 sixth x cubed plus x evaluated from 1 to, to 3. So I'll do the evaluation at the top limit or the upper limit, subtract off the evaluation 
at the lower limit. And I'll have to work that out carefully. 3 to the power of 4 is 81. 3 cubed is 27. 27 times 5 is 135. And I rewrote the 3 as 18 over 6. So I'm just going to get everything with a common denominator. And then at the lower limit, I have negative 1 sixth plus 5 6, and then I write 1 as 6 over 6. So with a common denominator, I can combine uh, the fractions, and I'll wind up with 72 over 6 minus 10 over 6, which is 62 over 6, which simplifies to the same answer I got before, 31 over 3. Now this was still a little bit of arithmetic that I had to do here, but it was much simpler. Altogether, being careful, it took four lines as opposed to four pages. So in example three, I've got a calculation that I've worked out here. And there's a problem. This is not the, the correct answer for the, uh, this definite integral. And I'm asking you to find out what's wrong with it. Well, let's go through it step by step. In the first step, all I'm doing is I'm taking each term and dividing it by x squared x cubed over x squared is x. 1 over x squared is the same as x to the negative 2. And I want to write it as a power so I can use my power rule to evaluate the uh, antiderivative. So let's find the antiderivative. Antiderivative of x is just 1 half x squared. Antiderivative of x to the negative 2 power. I did that carefully. Remember, you have to add 1, so negative 2 plus 1 gives me negative 1. Then divide by the new exponent, dividing by negative 1. So the next step, all I did was clean that up. I kept 1 half x squared. x to the negative 1 power would be 1 over x. I had a minus, but then I'm dividing by negative 1, so minus a minus will make a plus. And I have to evaluate that from negative 2. 1. So substituting the upper bound, that's just a direct substitution, and another direct substitution with the lower bound. Let's see if I did the arithmetic correctly. This will just be 1 half minus 1, so that would be a negative 1 half. And this is going to be half of 4, positive 4, so that would be 2. 2 minus a half is 3 halves. But then I'm subtracting that. So I have negative 1 half minus 3 halves. And that equals negative 2. So I said this is wrong, but every single step seems to be correct. Well, it's a little bit of a trick question because if we go back and review the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we said that the function needed to be continuous on the entire interval. If we had any discontinuities, we could break it up into multiple parts at the discontinuities, provided that the discontinuities were either jump discontinuities or removable discontinuities. We could not have any infinite discontinuities. Well, in this problem, the integrand has an infinite discontinuity when x equals 0. There is a vertical asymptote in the graph of x cubed minus 1 over x squared. And so I cannot use the fundamental theorem of calculus. In fact, we will not learn how to evaluate this or to even determine if this uh, definite integral is even defined uh, until you get to calculus two. And spoiler, it turns out that this integral is not defined.
So we have to be careful about using the fundamental theorem of calculus to make sure we don't have any uh, infinite discontinuities on the interval from the lower bound to the upper bound. All right, uh, in this example, we're gonna find the uh, area under the parabola four minus x squared, y equals four minus x squared between negative two and positive two. So here's our graph of the parabola. And I can see from the graph or from our algebraic test that this is an even function. So the area would be the definite integral from negative 2 to positive 2 of 4 minus x squared dx. But since I have a, an even function, I can write that as twice the integral from 0 to 2 of 4 minus x squared dx. This really helps us, even if you have a simple function, it's so much easier to perform an evaluation when you're substituting zero. So, uh, and certainly it's easier than putting in some negative number like negative two. So let's find the antiderivative. Antiderivative of four is four x. The antiderivative of x squared is one third x cubed. I'll have to evaluate that from zero to two. And then after I perform the evaluation, I have to remember that I'm multiplying by two because of the symmetry. So inside the parentheses, I'm performing the evaluation first at the upper bound, which is two. Then at the lower bound, which now is zero, and you can see that, oh, I've eliminated one of the eliminations because the low, at the lower bound, the evaluation is zero. So that just turns out to be zero. So I only need to work out uh, four times two is eight, and this will be minus uh, eight over three. Still inside the parentheses, and I'll have to multiply that answer by two. So eight is the same as 24 divided by three. So with a common denominator, and that becomes 16 over three. And then I will uh, multiply that by two to get 32 over three. Now in our last example, we have an absolute value function in the integrand. And at first we might say, wow, how can I use the uh, fundamental theorem? I don't know of any function whose derivative contains an absolute value. And so, you know, we do have alternatives. We, this is a simple function. We could go ahead and sketch its graph and actually calculate the area under the graph between negative one and three. It's just two triangles. We could just do half base times height for each triangle and uh, find the value. But we can use the fundamental theorem here. We just have to do a little bit of algebra first. Remember that with the absolute value function, we can write that as a piecewise defined function. The absolute value of x minus 1 is just x minus 1 when the x minus 1, whatever is inside the absolute value, is positive. So when uh, x minus 1 is positive, um, so x minus 1 being positive, um, That is the same as saying x is being greater than or equal to 1. And on the other hand, if what's inside the absolute value is negative, when I take the absolute value, I just have to take the opposite sign because the absolute value always has to be positive. So 
let me clean up that statement here. So I would just have two different formulas for my integrand. One formula applies when x is to the right of 1. The other formula applies when x is to the left of 1. And since I part of my bounds are to the left and part of them are to the right, I could break this up as two integrals. And so my the bounds of the first integral are going to be from negative 1 to 1. That's where I have the change of formula. And I have to remember to use the formula for the function that when it's to the left of 1, when it's less than 1. Then my second integral will have bounds from 1 to 3. And now since I'm to the right of positive 1, I'm using the top part of the formula here as my integrand, x minus 1. So that's the only new part here to use the fundamental theorem. I'll still, for each integral, I need to take the antiderivative. I have to remember to keep the right bounds with each antiderivative and perform the evaluation. With the first integral, I go ahead and substitute 1. And that's my upper bound. Subtract off the substitution with the negative 1, which is my lower bound. With my second integral, I have a different antiderivative and I have different bounds. So first I'll need to substitute the upper bound 3 into this different antiderivative and then subtract off the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound, which is 1. And after that, carefully work out all of the arithmetic here. And then um, this actually worked out to be pretty well because I have a negative 1 half and a positive 1 half. So that'll be 0. Then I have a 1 plus 1 plus another 1, which makes 3. But then I subtract off 3. And so the only thing that's left is 9 halves minus 1 half, which will be 8 half, 8 halves, which equals 4. So we can see that with the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, provided that uh, I may need to break it up into multiple integrals, uh, and I may have to make sure that I don't have any infinite discontinuities. Uh, it provides a much simpler way of finding the value of a definite integral.